Recursion, another topic that keeps freshly enrolled CS students awake at night because they have a really hard time to understand why the program runs in this unintuitive way when a function calls itself. Additionally, it doesn't get any better when your professor is too lazy to provide a detailed hand simulation of how the recursive calls are processed step by step. That's why we're going to cover in this video what recursion is, how it works, and following up with two examples that's going to be hand simulated for the deep understanding of recursion. So stay tuned. So first, what is recursion? Recursion is essentially a function that calls itself. Additionally to that, we have a stopping condition to prevent our program from crashing. With that in mind, is there any formula that any recursion follows? Yes, there is. Recursion always uses these three steps. First, the recursive step, where the function calls itself, but each time with some small change. Then second, the base case, which acts as the stopping condition. And third and last, finishing the recursive call by going backwards to close all the previous recursive calls. To make these three steps not so theoretical, let's use these Russian doors as an analogy. We know after we open each door, we get a smaller door, till we hold the smallest door possible. And now we're adding a small detail where we just return when we hit the smallest door. If we write it in code, it would look like this. When we now analyze the code and try to spot the steps of the formula, we can see that our recursive step is in the return line where we open the next door and our change is basically that we go into the next smaller door. Then in the lines above, we have our base case where we stop when we finally found the last and the smallest door. Step three is a harder step to see since it's not directly visible in the code. But what basically happens is if we look at the doll animation, that every doll who called itself recursively is passing back the smallest door to the previous door. This might be confusing now since it's kind of hard to imagine and many students struggle to understand this step. But to really understand what goes on in the code and not just with some simplified animations, we still miss a puzzle, which is called the call stack. This will be key to understand every recursion step. So let's understand the call stack first and then hop into our two more CS realistic recursion hand simulations. So what is a call stack? The call stack is basically just the thing what helps us to keep track of function calls in our program, meaning in which order things get executed. So how does this work now? When functions get called, they're gonna be put on the stack. These elements will also call stack frames. They contain function local variables and parameters. When the function reads its end, the stack frame gets removed from the call stack. When multiple functions get put on the stack, the one on top will always be the one who's gonna get processed first. We also call this LIFO, which stands for last in, first out. With that being said, let's have a little example. We can see we have an add function and a multiply function, and both of these get executed in our main function. What now happens is, when our program gets run, our main function gets pushed onto the call stack, while we now process the main function, we come across the add function and push it onto our call stack as well. The consequence now is we stop processing the main and process now our add function because it is the top element of the stack. After we finished our add function with our return, we are going to remove it from the call stack and the return value gets passed to our integer x. At this point, some people might be confused because we said after the function is finished, we're gonna remove it from our stack meaning we basically don't have access anymore to our variables and parameters. So how can we even access the return value then? Well, most architectures don't even save the return value of a function on the stack frame. Instead, they temporarily save it in a CPU register so we can still access it after we removed our function from the call stack. All right, then back to our example. After our add function, we're back at our main function and process it again. While doing it, we come across our multiply function. This is then pushed on top of our main again, since it's still not done. Then we are processing our multiply, where we just multiply our x and four together and return it. After we returned our value, it gets removed from the stack and we are assigning the value from our register again to the integer y this time. Then come across return zero. And with this line, our main is also finally processed and we can finally also remove it from our stack. Okay, since we now understand the call stack, we can now go further and try to understand how recursion works. We are going to see two examples in depth now. Our first example is calculating the factorial of n, a classical example where we can use recursion to calculate it. Let's look at the recursive function to calculate the factorial. We can see we have a stopping condition when n equals one and a recursive call when we call the function in a different slash modified way to reach our stopping condition. All right, so let's do a little example and see how it works. 
we can see our main function where we want to assign our integer result the value of factorial 4. So what happens now? Let's look at our call stack and see how it will handle our function calling. So first of all, our main function get put on the call stack and this is getting processed. But then we stumble upon the value of assignment result. What now happens is factorial 4 is getting called, meaning it will now be placed on the call stack, main is paused and factorial 4 is now getting processed. When we process factorial of 4, we see 4 does not equal to 1. So we go to our recursive case, where we calculate 4 times factorial of 3, meaning now we are stopping processing of factorial of 4 and calling a new function factorial of 3, what is then put on the call stack and is going to be processed, while factorial of 4 is getting paused. We are checking like before if now 3 equals to 1, and it also does not, meaning we go to our recursive call where we return 3 times factorial of 2 and again the processing of factorial 3 is getting stopped and factorial 2 comes on top of the call stack and is getting processed. And again 2 does not equal to 1 so we go again to our recursive case where we return 2 times factorial of 1 and again a function call meaning we are pausing now the processing of factorial of 2 and factorial of 1 is now the one who's on top of the stack so we'll be the one who will be processed now. Again, we check if 1 equals to 1 and finally it does. We reached our stopping condition because we are returning 1 now and our recursion will finally stop calling more functions. Our solution for factorial 4 will now be built up layer by layer because if we now look at it, factorial of 1 is done processing and is getting removed from the call stack. His return value of 1 is then passed to factorial of 2 since it was this function who called factorial of 1 and then we are ending up with 2 times 1 instead of 2 times factorial of 1. After doing the calculation and returning, factorial of 2 is done processing and getting removed from the stack and the value from that will be passed to factorial of 3. And the same thing happening like before. 3 times factorial of 2 becomes 3 times 2 because this is the calculated value for factorial of 2 and so on. <laughs> In the end, we calculated the value of factorial 4 and we can see that our result in the main function equals to 24. And our main also returns 0 now and is also removed from our call stack and we are done. Then let's hop into a more complex example called the Fibonacci sequence. The history behind it is that apparently it should describe the population of rabbits. Why did we choose this example specifically? If we look at the sequence, we can see a pattern that the next number in the Fibonacci sequence is always built with the two previous numbers, which we can write as a mathematical expression, which looks like that. This is already a recursive expression that we can translate into code. We can see when we hit our base case for n equals 1 or n equals 2, we are returning 1, because we know that for n equals 1 and 2, that we have the value of 1. But in any other case, we are calculating the value with the two values prior from n, what we nearly straight up just copied from our mathematical expression. Okay, then let's just simulate it like our factorial. We have a main function again, and we want to calculate Fibonacci of 4. What now happens is, again, main is our first function that is getting called, so it's put on the call stack. Then we come across the Fibonacci of 4 function call, and this comes on top of the stack and will get processed. I'm gonna do a drawing on the side, so it's easier to keep track of the recursion. So when we now process the function, we can see our 4 is not equal to 1 or 2. So we go to our recursive case, where we return Fibonacci of n minus 1 plus Fibonacci of n minus 2. And we can see we have a function call, meaning Fibonacci of 3 is now getting put on top of the call stack and getting processed. But attention now. I see many new people struggle with recursion in this part. They think the next function getting processed is this. But that's actually not the case for recursion in our example. Let's continue and see why. When we now process our Fibonacci of 3, we see 3 is not equal to 1 or 2. So we go to our recursive case again and the function call of Fibonacci of 2, meaning we put it on the stack and it gets processed now. We can see this time our base case applies because 2 equals to 2 and we return 1. So we're done, meaning the function now gets popped off the stack. And now we continue to process our Fibonacci of 3 and we see we calculated Fibonacci of 2 what's resulted in 1, and now we are adding Fibonacci of 1 to it, what is a function call which gets put on the stack and is processed now. 
We can see the base case applies, so we are done. The function also returns one as well. Now we resume with Fibonacci of three, and we can see we calculated both recursive calls and now can return the value of two for Fibonacci of three. This is finally done processing, and we are continuing with Fibonacci of four, where we now finally calculate this part. So we can see Fibonacci of two is now getting put on the call stack, and we can see the base case applies, and we return one. So this is finished. Now we continue with Fibonacci of four again, and we only add two plus one together, and we return it, so we are done with Fibonacci of four, and then we resume with our main function, where we pass it to our result variable, and after main returns with zero, main is also finally done processing. All right, thanks for watching again. If you found my video helpful, please leave a like and subscribe, since it's always a big effort to do the voice acting and the animations.